Hello and welcome and thank you for joining us uh, at this virtual conversation. Uh, I'm welcoming you from Literaturhaus Berlin and um, I have two guests who are joining me today. Laurie Kubuzile, who is joining us from Botswana and also Novuyo Rosa Chuma, who is joining us from the United States. Welcome to both of you. My name is Venice Trommer. I am uh, actually a translator, a bookseller, and also a publisher with Intercontinental. And I have actually had the honor to meet both of these lovely people in person at the past African book festivals. Uh, Novuyo was a guest in 2019, and Laurie was a guest last year. And I'm part of the organizational team there as well. So, uh, let me first introduce my two guests to those of you who don't know them yet. Novuyo Rosa Chuma is the author of House of Stone, which was published in 2019 by uh, W.W. Norton in the US and later on by Atlantic in the UK. Um, the book has won the Edward Stanford Travel Writing Award and was um, also the Bulawayo Arts Award for Outstanding Fiction. And it was listed for several other prizes for the Orwell Prize for Political Fiction, the Dylan Thomas Prize, uh, and for example, also the Rathbones Folio Prize. Novuyo has also published a collection of novella and short stories titled Shadows, which was published in 2013 by Quela Books in South Africa and went on to win the Herman Charles Bozeman Prize and was also listed for the Isti Salat Prize for African Literature. Novuyo Rosa Chuma also is the recipient of the 20 nine or 2009 Yvonne Vera Award, which is Zimbabwe's short fiction prize. She also received several honors, including a 2017 Bellagio Center Literary Arts Re Residency and the 2020 Lennon Foundation Fiction Fellowship. She is an assistant professor of fiction at Emerson College and was a visiting assistant professor of uh, fiction at the Iowa Writers Workshop. She has taught community fiction workshops globally. In 2019, um, she was uh, an artist or a writer in residence at uh, Literarisches Colloquium Berlin. Raised in Zimbabwe and South Africa, she currently lives in Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. And her debut novel, House of Stone, will be published in German as House of Stein th um, this year in August um, at Intercontinental Verlag and her sophomore novel, Digging Stars, is forthcoming this fall from W.W. W. Norton in the US. Welcome, Novuyu. Thank you so much, Venice, and thank you for a real warm welcome. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here um, talking once again. It's such a pleasure to talk to you again. I'm a big fan of your book. I hope you remember that from when we met uh, at the African Book Festival. So I'm um, just very happy to also soon be able to um, urge people to read the German translation as well. And also joining us is Laurie Kubuzile. She's a novelist, a short story writer, and a writer of children's books. And she has been awarded several prizes as well, such as the Globe and Glo the Golden such as the Golden Baobab Prize for African Children's Writing, the Botswana Prize uh, for Creative Writing by Botswana's Ministry of Youth, Sport and Culture. She was uh, a finalist for the 2011 Kane Prize and um, her books are prescribed readings in schools in Botswana as well as in South Africa. Her historical novel, The Scattering, was published in 2016 by Penguins in South Africa and Waveland Press in the United States in 2017. It won Best International Fiction Book at the 2017 Sharjah International Book Fair and was recommended by the Walter Scott Prize for Historical Fiction in the UK in 2017 as well. It has been optioned for a film by a German production company and the German translation of the novel called Zerstreuung was published by Intercontinental Verlag this past August. Her second historical novel, But Deliver Us From Evil, 
was published by Penguin in South Africa in 2019 and long listed for the NOMO uh, Award in 2020. And that same year, her legal, legal thriller romance novel Revelations was published by Love Africa Press. She lives in Botswana in a village with her daughter and grandson, three dogs and a cat. Welcome, Laurie. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So, um, and uh, maybe I forgot to mention that um, both my guests are contributed to the um, New Daughters of Africa um, anthology edited by Margaret Busby. That is a compilation of over 200 um, writers, women writers from Africa and of African descent and is like a great encyclopedia to look for all the, all the good names in there and you'll find okay. both of them. So um, the topic of our conversation today is women in war, women in war in literature. And we will be mainly focusing on the two novels, um, Scatter The Scattering and House of Stone. Um, I would like to give a short introduction to the two books, to our viewers. Um, but I will first very loosely quote uh, one of the characters in Mohamed Bougassar's Prix Goncourt winning novel La plus secrète mémoire des hommes, who says something to the extent of a really great book is never really about anything. In truth, only a mediocre book or a bad book or an insignificant book is about something. So I'm very tempted to say that the two books are about nothing because they are great books. I will still try <laughs> to sum, sum things up, at least, even if um, it's just going to be part of it. Um, to me, reading House of Stone felt like taking an onion apart layer by layer, slowly arriving at the core, while at the same time putting the layers back together and getting the bigger picture. Um, it's highly complex book, but um, it sets out telling Zimbabwean history and it elaborates on how history is told. Um, it also gradually turns into a psychological study of the deeply traumatized characters and their quest for a sense of belonging. And in a way, these characters are representative of a deeply, deeply traumatized people. The story is told by an unreliable first person narrator who himself is a product of the violence at the heart of the story, the Gukurahundi massacres or the Gukurahundi genocide, uh, a genocide of the Ndebele, Ndebele committed in the early 1980s by the government of the newly independent Zimbabwe a violent event that has been swept under the rug um, by the official Zimbabwean historiography. Um, and since we are talking about women, women characters, um, there are important, significant women characters in the story, although the narrator is a man. Um, there is Tandi, the first love of Abednego, whom Zamani, the narrator, refers to as a surrogate father, and Mama Agnes, Abednego's wife and Zamani's so-called surrogate mother. Novuyo, could you um, elaborate a bit on what compelled you to take on the maybe the huge task or the huge burden of telling a story that is so kind of all-encompassing because it is a lot about Zimbabwean history over a huge span of time, but also then tackling the task of resurfacing the history of the Gukurahundi genocide that people did not want to pay attention to. Well, um, thank you so much, um, Venice. That was a very uh, generous introduction of, of House of Stone, um, a book very dear to my heart. You know, um, I started this book to, um, I was trying to understand who we were as a people, Zimbabwe. Um, I was in my early 20s, I'd moved to South Africa and I was feeling very unwelcome there. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to get a sense of self, um, a sense of belonging, a sense of community. And so um, 
I'd actually read Gunter Cross's The Tin Drum, which is one of the books that inspired this novel. And I really wanted to try and understand our history. And so I just went through the archives. Um, this was the Wits University in South Africa. I spoke to relatives. Um, I revisited my own past in Zimbabwe. And then in talking to family, in particular, my mother, Kukura Hundi, became a very sore spot. My mother could talk about the Liberation War. She could talk about growing up in Zimbabwe. She could talk about her life after, you know, independence as a, you know, when she moved from the village and moved to the city of Ulawayo. But when I asked about Kukura Hundi, she froze. I remember she was cooking. I was just, I asked, so very generally, very casually, and she froze. And she would not talk about it. And that was my first inkling that this, there was a wound there, a wound that we always knew growing up, but that was really swept under the carpet. And that, and that became something I wanted to excavate and try and understand. Um, so in, in trying to write and excavate Zimbabwe's history, I discovered that it's an extremely complex history. Um, there is no one straight narrative, depending on who you're talking to. Um, whether the ex rhodesians of Zimbabwe, whether the people of Matebele land, whether the people of Mashona land, it cuts across class. Um, and, and so I, I, I realized I couldn't tell one cohesive history. And this is where Zaman's fractured consciousness comes in, this unpeeling of an onion's layers that we were talking about. And so really my question was, um, in, I really wanted to answer one question in Zimbabwe, who are we? And where have we come from and how have we become the people we have become? Um, I would say that the disintegration of Zimbabwe in my teens was a great shock um, to everyone um, in, in, in Zimbabwe. It, it felt so unreal. And, and this, this is part of um, the wound that um, inspired or set me off on this journey. Thank you. And um, The Scattering, too, is a historical novel. Um, mm -hmm. set in a in a different time though um, it's set between 1897 and 1908 mm -hmm. and one of the protagonists Riette is the daughter of white settlers of Dutch descent um, whose life is uprooted when the British try to conquer the Boer republics of southern Africa in the Boer wars uh, Chipuka, on the other hand the second protagonist of the novel is Herero and um, was in what was then the German colony of West, Southwest Africa. And uh, in order to break the anti-colonial resistance, the Germans begin the systematic extinction, uh, the genocide of the Herero, Herero people. Um, survivors are scattered, many of them fleeing to Bechuana land, what is today Botswana. And uh, there, Rietes and Jipuka's oh. paths cross. Laurie, um, was it the presence of descendants of genocide survivors in uh, Botswana that made you want to write about this neglected part of, uh, of history, of German Namibian history? Um, no, not really. In actual fact, um, I've often told this story when I've spoken about the sketching. Uh, my family, uh, when my children were young, uh, I was a teacher, my husband was a teacher also, <clears throat> and so we used to go camping. We'd, we'd put the tent in the car and drive across the Kalahari and then the Namib Desert and go camping at the coast. And one year uh, we camped at Shack Island in Luderitz. It's a campground. And uh, then later I went to the Cape Town Book Fair and I, I met uh, Jane Kachavivi, who is an important Namibian writer, publisher, she died last year, unfortunately. But um, I met her for the first time. I just read her book. She, she wrote a very good memoir, uh, and The Undisciplined Heart, which was published by Mojaji Books. And I met her at the Cape Town Book Fair. And I was telling her, you know, we love Namibia. We always go to Namibia. And we were camping at, in, at Shark Island in Luderitz. And she said to me, um, do you know the history there? I said, no. So she started to tell me, and uh, I was disgusted, actually. I was disgusted that we camped there. <laughs> I was disgusted that there's no sign there. It was a concentration camp. <clears throat> it would be like, you know, uh, camping at Auschwitz. And uh, so, you know, I live in Mahalapi, which is the place where uh, Maharero eventually settled with the people that came over in 1904. 
So I, I know a lot of Herero people in my village. We have a ward, we have a school. So I felt really um, negligent as a citizen of Botswana, a citizen of Southern Africa, <clears throat> not knowing the history. And so I just started uh, educating myself. And uh, as I was educating myself, uh, a story started to come into my mind about, because I was thinking, in fact, at the time I was thinking of two books. I was thinking of uh, Memory of Love by Aminata Forna about the war in Sierra Leone and <clears throat> also Half of a Yellow Sun by Chimamanda Adichie. And that, that sort of personalizing of a war, like it's easy, you know, when somebody says 100,000 people, or, or in this case, I think it's 45,000 Herrera were murdered. Uh, it, it's easy to let that pass. It, it doesn't have any emotional resonance. But when you know that this person, you know, this person died, this person was killed, I think, um, and when you learn the story, uh, I think the proper perspective is gained. So yeah, it, it, it came from my own personal experience and much like Nobuo was saying, just to educate myself. And I really did think that the novel was uh, sort of out of my weight class. I mean, I was doing writing romance, I was writing children's books. I did write literary short fiction, but nothing to this extent. And it took me many years of research and, and writing various, uh, additions to get the book that I have. But yeah, that's where it came from. It was just to educate myself. Yeah, since you mentioned research, um, I was wondering how the two of you went about your research because they're both historical novels, both are about historical events that have not gotten the extent of research that they could have and should have gotten, um, how were you able to find information and uh, did the archives offer much information about women's experiences in particular? It's a question to both of you. I don't know who wants to start answering. Uh, I, I could just explain okay. that uh, I read a lot of books. Uh, for one, I, I did research in Botswana archives. Um, and like you say, especially the Herero side of the war, it's very not well documented. Like I remember a, a poem that was translated from Oji Herero to English that um, had to do with doves around the watering hole and um, in the desert when they're fleeing. So some of it that came from many different sources. And then of course, after I finished, I had two, I had a, um, a, 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 a Motswana Herero historian look through the book and tell me where, if anything is wrong, I also had a Namibian um, uh, man who also knew the Afrikaans history, the uh, the Anglo Boer War history. I read a lot of um, yeah. There's a lot more about the Anglo -Boer, the Second Anglo Boer War, of course, than the German Herero War. Wow. Yeah. Um. Like Lori, I did a lot of reading. Um. This was at the University of Witwatersrand. They have an excellent library. And so I read a lot of, you'd call them, I guess, academic texts, right? Texts written by historians, written by, you know, literary scholars, uh, written by anthropologists. But to me, it really didn't feel like that kind of work. And I think it's because it was my history, a history I didn't know, and I was so hungry for it. And in reading about that history, in particular, the Liberation War era, that's, that, that, those were a lot of texts that were available. Um, it, it felt like learning about myself, right? It felt about learning about my my country, my place, uh, my people. This place I'd never really paid much attention to or interest in because, you know, um, the zanu PF government has had a monopoly of history and we were really taught not to, you know, history in Zimbabwe, you're made to feel as though you're not part of that history, that you don't have a say in that history if you're not part of the zanu PF um, liberation movement. Um, you're made to feel as though you're not Zimbabwean. So learning that history was a way of reclaiming my own, um, own my own belonging in Zimbabwe. Now with Kukura Hundi, it was a bit tricky because I, I don't think that there, there are not many texts on that, but there's the Catholic Commission report, which was conducted in the 90s, which is one of the most harrowing reports um, on the massacres. Um, we have firsthand testimonies um, 
from the victims and from the soldiers. And that was my main sort of text, written text. That then also pushed me again to talk to family. I spoke to family, I spoke to my mother. Um, and that was very difficult because family members did not want to talk about um, the massacres. My, my mother actually learned um, that she was a refugee during the, the massacres. Um, she was sent off to a, a refugee camp in Botswana. Um, and that features in the book when Tandi uh, goes to a refugee camp. That's taken from the stories my mother told me. Um, and so, you know, when I was in Zimbabwe, just when I was researching this book, so I moved from South Africa to um, the United States, to the Iowa Writers Workshop. Again, they have an excellent library full of African texts, full of, this was really sad for me, full of books written in Gabriel and Shana, books that we don't have access to in Zimbabwe. So that was another form of research. Then when I went back home, I wanted to go to the villages, to the area where they, they had been, the Bukura Hundi and the massacres, where there were mass graves. And I was told not to go there. I was warned that you cannot go there. Um, you know, it's it's not safe, you you know. Um, and so I actually was not able to access um, those places personally. Um, there's a lot of archives about the massacres that are not available to the public in Zimbabwe. And so I bring that to say this informed how the book is written, right? It's a, it's a book about people telling stories about their history. And that's why history in the novel is not, it's not one concrete sort of, straight story it's many multiple fractured stories that sometimes overlap sometimes contradict and um it, it came from the act of researching the novel and realizing um it was very difficult to get at the so-called truth yeah probably especially with with family and those uh, dynamics and they did also make it into the story of the book um, people being so reluctant to open up about the things that happened to them and um, about um, how painful it also is to open up these old wounds by talking about what happened, um, which is yeah, quite um, quite an issue in the story as well. Um, and in both your novels, I mean, we we there are lots of parallels in a way because we, they both um, are about a genocide. They both have concentration camps. They both have women being kind of pawns in in the hands of of soldiers and um also women as as or keeping women in camps in order to break the men's resistance um yeah i don't know really what my question is there but um I find it striking the parallels in the different genocides at different times and it does um, in the scattering it becomes a bit obvious also or I was wondering whether it was a, a choice also to um, to not contrast but to um, have the the concentration camps of the Anglo-Boer war and the concentration camps of the genocide of the Herero um, in the book, because you see how also armies learned from one another, how things evolved um, in, in that direction. Um, and you were both telling very gruesome stories. And I was also wondering how do you find the right words to speak the unspeakable, to um, to find words for the atrocities that are committed without maybe traumatizing or re-traumatizing potential readers. Um, um, I can just say that, uh, <clears throat> yes, definitely I wanted that uh, idea of the concentration camps to be seen that it was in the ether. It was something that the English did to the Boer women and children, but also in a book that needs to be written by somebody are, are the concentration camps of the black workers of the Boer uh, women and the Boer farms, which were horrendous, which I saw when I did my research. And how that fed into, you know, what, what the Germans decided to do in, in Namibia and eventually I think even later. <clears throat> As to the, um, you know, 
the thing about for me, I really wanted this idea of uh, women, first of all, being, as you say, pawns. Women don't normally choose the wars. Yeah? They're mm -hmm. imposed on them. Mm -hmm. And Riet, uh, especially, she had no allegiance to uh, her family, no allegiance to the man she was forced to marry. And um, so, you know, she was just caught up in all of this. And okay, Shipuka to some extent, the, you know, she, she she supported the war at the beginning, but I think realized that, you know, there was maybe a mistake had been made, there might have been a better way. But women, besides having to be the pawns and the victims, they often have to do things that um, to survive. Mm -hmm. And they're judged and and punished for the rest of their lives. And uh, this is something else that I wanted to speak about. I mean, it's not your war, but you you are finding any way to get through it. And yet the very people who started the war will be the ones that will be judging you for what you did to survive. So this is one of the important themes that I wanted to show in the book. And then, um, yeah, for me, and this is kind of the case for me uh, in any instance where there's high emotion, um, I, I really do believe that you must just state it in simple, as simple words as possible. And, and um, people, the reader must feel it, but um, you know, uh, you don't want to exploit it in any way. I mean, it's horrible enough in the simple words. Yeah. Yeah, and I also um, feel sorry, <laughs> I'm interrupting again. I also feel like um, in the scattering, the the gruesome acts are always contrasted at times by acts of kindness as well. There, um, there's this unbreakable bond between Chipuka and her childhood friend Novengi, um, who are yeah, supporting each other through the worst. Um, there are acts of kindness by other people that kind of pull the reader through the story without complete despair. <laughs> and also what uh, gets Tipuka to, through her life without completely despairing. And I found also that was um, a good contrast there. I, I do think that um, we have an obligation as writers always to uh, make our characters to be realistic. And even the most horrendous person, you know, is somebody's son, is somebody's lover. And, and so, um, I mean, even the heroes do horrible things. So I, I'm always very careful to make sure that, uh, yeah, we are kind and we are cruel. We're complex and that's how it should be. Yeah, um, when listening to Lori speak about her, her female character who started supporting the war, had me think about Tandy in, in, in my novel, who's really um, supports the liberation war, but she's a city girl. And so her, her, her activism is really very bourgeois, right? It's in the city. And, and the experiences in the city during the liberation war were different from the more brutal, naked brutality in the villages. Um, and, and I bring that up to say, um, for me, I think writing about Kukura Hundi, what helped me was, you know, I thought of my mother, right? My mother, I, I would never have thought of my mother as a victim of a genocide or even a war victim, right? When I was born, she lived in the city. She's a teacher, very happy, right? Um, but complex, right? It's only when you start crying, right? And peeling the peeling the onions that you really get to this really complex um, life, these multiple lives. And that informed for me both Tandy and Agnes, which is to say, um, I really wanted to capture their lives with Tandy before the genocide. Um, and I think with a character like Mama Agnes, even after the genocide, if you're not inside her head, if, if you're not with Zamani trying to peel the onions, you would not really know what this past has been like. But with Gugura Hundi, I do not know that the reader is not traumatized in my novel, but um, I think for me it becomes important because 
for me, the audience I had, I was speaking to Zimbabweans first and foremost. And we had been taught growing up to look away. Like if you hear the conversations about the massacres in Zimbabwe, it's quite shocking. And I think it has to do with this idea um, that Laura was talking about, that numbers. When you talk about numbers, when you talk about, say, the Ndebele, just as a people, when you don't see people as people, it's very easy to dismiss them. It's very callous conversations about the massacres. And, and, and you get the sense that we don't really, we haven't really taken the time to see, to understand what it meant, right, to see the human. And, and so it was shocking for me as well when I was doing the research because I knew about the Burahundi growing up, but I didn't really know. And this for me is the difference between knowing and actually knowing. And so the, the genocide, the, 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 the moments where the massacres occur are quite graphic, I think, for me in the novel. And for me, it was a, a, my, my task um, at the time was not to look away. It was, we are told to look away, do not look away. Um, and, and so for me, what anchors those moments is the fact that we follow these characters throughout their lives. We've seen that they are complex characters, um, even though they, have, they may end in brutal and tragic ways. The massacres were tragic. There are people now in Zimbabwe who are still living the effects of, of Kukura Hundi, who we do not see in society. We don't see them. They have no birth certificates. It's, it's illegal to talk about the massacres. So if, if you were a victim and you have ailments, psychological, physical, you cannot even say why this happened to you. And I, I wanted to really sit with that. Um, Zimbabwe for me is a tragic story, it was still unraveling, um, but I did not want to run away from that tragedy. Um, as a way of denying the weight of what we've been through. Um, I, I, I think I traumatized myself too in writing this novel, but I'd say it was also an effect of youth. I was young and I did not realize that I was traumatizing myself until the act of writing the novel. When I was in Iowa, I actually had a therapist <laughs> who I ended up, we ended up talking about the novel most of the time. It's interesting looking back that she helped me process these things I was reading and writing about, I was too maybe naive to realize what I was doing, what it meant to take on this task. It's only in the act of writing and on the other side that you realize what this is. And it is, it is right that as a reader, the, um, the book is disturbing at times. Uh, at times it's really hard to go on reading, but then I also found that there's some other passages that are not as gruesome in content are just written so beautifully that you just want to go on reading and that I often with those passages I had to go back and read them twice or three times because I found them so beautiful. Um, so that's kind of what kept me going forward and also you do want to know what happened to these people. I mean, you mentioned there's Zamani who is trying to get these stories out of the other characters in the story. Um, first and foremost of Abednego and uh, Mama Agnes. And he is a very good example of the very ambiguous characters because you get so contradicting feelings towards that character as a reader. On the one hand, you are full of pity for him and you you do kind of learn to understand where he's coming from but he is so manipulative he's he's manipulating these people into sharing their their most precious secrets with him and to unbury the the trauma with him for him but not for their own for therapeutic reasons, but for his wish to find somewhere where he can belong. But yeah, it's very, he's such a contradicting person. Um, yes, I, you know, I will say, I, I will say, I, I just briefly, I think Zamani for me um, epitomizes, I, I guess, how difficult it, it is to excavate such a history without the structures um, there. And I'm thinking maybe of the truth. Tr Truth Commission in South Africa, which is not necessarily perfect, but we don't have those structures in Zimbabwe. So when I got to the end of the book, I realized that money is unwittingly repeating, reenacting the traumas that he has lived through. And it made me think of our liberation war heroes. Mugabe is a controversial character who 
perhaps at first during the Liberation War may have had noble ideas of justice, but went through his own traumas. And, and you find this constantly in the post-colonial nation where it's in the, reenacting the traumas of colonialism. And so it's, it's not something I intended to do, but when I got to the end of the book, I realized perhaps this is what is happening, right? What does it mean to excavate such difficult histories in a place that is resistant without the structures? Is it an act of carelessness, but then how do we also work through these histories if we do not excavate them? You also said that first and foremost, uh, you had a Zimbabwean audience in mind when you wrote the book. Um, is the book, um, but it is very um, critical of the, at that time, while we were writing the book, still current government, um, current leader uh, as well. Um, did was the book is the book available in Zimbabwe or was it more um, exiled Zimbabweans who had access to the text or do you know yeah in, um, well you know they you know Zimbabwe is interesting because um, local publishers have published some 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 very contentious books Christopher Mlala Z wrote about the genocide no Violet's latest book is really uh, um, very critical. Um, but they, they were loath to publish House of Stone and it was mainly because of the character of Black Jesus in the novel. That was the reason that they gave because everyone knows, it's the sort of thing where Black Jesus, everyone in Zimbabwe knows who Black Jesus is. Black Jesus is very prominent in the book and is seen enacting all sorts of atrocities. And, and so that, that was, the, the local publishers were loath to, to, to to publish the book. So it doesn't have the Zimbabwean publisher. That made me very sad. It was a shock because in my mind, I had this, this vision that it will, I will, it will publish at home and as it is published here and it, it will be read by, because I wanted to have a conversation with Zimbabweans. That was my, my vision. So that has been a great frustration. Um, it's, it's the diaspora that reads the book. I did launch the book in Zimbabwe, um, mm -hmm. at the United States, um, um, department offices. I was a bit nervous about about launching it there, and it was a very emotional time for me. Um, a lot of the Ndebeles came out, and they it, it was amazing being read by your own people and having them recognize themselves in the book and and, and say you're writing about us, um, you're telling our story. Um, and, and so that's something I um, I wish I, I wish I wish it would I wish it was available at home, but it is not at this time. And Laurie, with uh, with your book, um, is it available in Namibia? And um, if you know, how have people reacted to it? Um, and I mean, it is now available in Germany in, in German translation as well. Um, because isn't it even more important for Germans, especially Germans, to to know about that part of their history or our history, um, which is unfortunately not part or not really part of any school curriculums or I'm maybe not completely up to date, but when I was going to school, it was not. Um, how, how do you feel about that? The book, the book uh, when it came out in 2016, yes, it was available in Namibia. And even I was in Windhoek. Actually, I left Berlin from the festival. I went straight to Windhoek and um, I took the, some of the German copies uh, I gave to the bookstores there because they didn't have English copies by that time. Um, when the book first came out, uh, sort of like a full circle moment, uh, you know, I told you that Jane Kachibibi was the one who um, told me what happened on Shark Island. And when the book came out, she and her husband, and her husband is uh, Herrero, he's a historian, and I actually used some of his academic papers when I was writing the book. And he's the, he's the speaker of the parliament in, in Namibia. And um, he asked if I, if I would like to launch the book at the parliament building, at the restaurant there. And yes, of course, I was very honored. And um, uh, he was supposed to actually be the guest speaker, but he had to get called away because uh, someone in Europe who had supported Swapo had died and he had to go, but he sent his friend. But at, at that launch, um, it was very interesting because um, 
the, the, the people who really, okay, of course, even, even uh, I launched the book in Maun in Botswana, where, the, where a lot of, you know, the, the book take, uh, scattering takes place in Ngamiland. So there's a lot of uh, Bahareiro who live in Maun. And also in Maun, the Bahareiro, many of them didn't know the history. Even the woman who interviewed me at the launch, she's Herero, and she didn't know the history. And, but then at the parliament in, in Windhoek, the, the German people who live in, in uh, Namibia, they didn't know the history, many of them. So they were happy to read the book. And um, I think what was very nice, uh, actually, just now um, when, I came, when I was in Windhoek for when I came back from Berlin, um, a man, because the book came out in 2016 in English. So now, you know, it's quite old. There was a man, a librarian, Herrero librarian, sitting in the front row at my session. And afterwards, you know, as soon as question time, you know, he, he stood up and he said, you know, I, I, I read this book and it changed me. And I've given it to all the Herrero people in my family. They've all read it. So I think, um, I mean, of course, some people feel, and I think we know this from the festival, that I'm not the person who should have written this book. Uh, but uh, I think the Herrero people, the because pe even the book is dedicated to my friend. I have a, well, she, really, she's really my sister. She's been my friend for 30 years, um, Who a, a woman who's half German and half Herrero. When she, she's, my, she's my very good sister. And um, a lot of about, I mean, I don't want to give away the ending of the book, but, uh, you know, a lot came from thinking about her. Yeah? So I think, um, yeah, in Namibia people know the book, and uh, unfortunately now it's only it, the English edition is mostly out of print, so it's only the German people in Namibia who can read it now. But yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that is also um, present in both your novels and a part of the experience of women in most wars, I would say, is that rape is also used as part of warfare and that soldiers impose themselves in that way on women's bodies for various reasons, but it's the ultimate demonstration of power and of domination. And both your texts, um, in, in both your texts, there are important, um, important passages in the text where rape happens. Um, how did you go about writing about rape in the text? I don't know if I can start, but it, 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 of course it's not easy. But again, like Novua said, uh, you have to say what happened. And like there's a scene at the beginning of the scattering uh, where Shipuka watch, watches a woman being raped. And, you know, it's hard for me, like even when I have to read that, you know, I, I, sometimes I cry. I mean, I mean, writing it was hard, but yeah, but it has to be there. I mean, it's what happens in war. It's what's happening right now as we sit here, when wars are happening, that's what happens to women. women like I said before, women don't choose these wars. But they're the ones who carry the burden and, and in so many ways carry the psychological burden for everyone, actually. They have to clean up all the mess. Yeah. Yes, I, I think to echo Lori, um, especially reading the testimonies about both the Liberation War and Kukura Hundi, there were just so many gruesome experiences. And, and so. I, I felt my task was just not to look away in, in trying to rewrite um, those experiences. And, you know, I, I do not know if I would write this book now the way I did then, but I, I do think my writing of this book is also for me a product of having grown up in Zimbabwe, where it was so, and I don't know if this is a bad thing, we're just so um, numb. Um, we're, we're people, we laugh, we're very happy people and we laugh a lot. And, and I wonder if laughter is also still that response to um, 
to so much trauma in our history, right? It's it's complex, of course. We're happy people. I had a happy childhood, but there's also this darkness. And so I, I think my ability also to sit with it for me had to do with just the culture I grew up in where feeling, private feeling is not really discussed publicly. Um, there, there are other ways of connecting that are more very communal or that, that protect us from these things. So in my digging deep into this, um, I was writing from that place, right? Almost, almost from that place of, of, of this sort of numb place, numb from the traumas of history, but also then trying to excavate that feeling, if that makes sense. I do not know if I'd have the stomach for it now, but it is a book for me of its time. And, and, and that's why I say when I say I'm writing to Zimbabweans, it's because it's, there are things in the book that speak to a very particular way of being, way of growing up, a culture. And, and, you know, compared to other people in the world, Zimbabweans find so much to laugh about in the novel. They're the one people who read the novel and come to me laughing, like, oh my goodness, this section, right? And, and, and so it's also maybe a way not to talk about some of the difficult aspects. When I launched the book in Harare, Kukura Hundi was not mentioned at all during the launch, which was fascinating. But I think it speaks to that, to that complex. Yeah, it's, it's, it's complex. Yeah. Yeah, I would now like to, to quote um, Riet, uh, one of the protagonists from The Scattering, um, who at one point says, men fight, men make war that destroys everything, and women carry the wounds, they clean it up, they rub it away, and they go on, on and on. And yet men pound their chests and say, we are the winners. What? What? What do they win? They win the right to say they're animals and killers. That's not a win. And women keep going. Head down, they move forward. They bind the wounds. They stroke the foreheads. They bear the children and they bury them. And this man blames you. He should blame himself, himself and his kind. War is for men. It's always for men. Um, I've already heard a little bit that maybe, Laurie, you would kind of agree with with what Riet says here, with her assessment of um, where war comes from and um, what's the results of it. Um, but on the other hand, that's also not the, the entire role that you give women in the war because the scattering also features women who, um, who were fighting, who also, at least at first in the war, who carried rifles into into battle and and were fighting but um still would you more or less agree with what Rietta says I mean I think I'm trying to think now my daughter yesterday was saying something someone from the United Nations I think was leave was retiring and she was watching and the person said something that if if women were the leaders we wouldn't have the wars. I mean, I do think women can get on board with a war, but I think women would choose every other path except for war. You know, I mean, in the end, uh, we, we make all the humans in our bodies and uh, we want to protect them. So even in a, in a, a, if there's such a thing as a righteous war, like the war of independence in Zimbabwe, um, still, I think women would find some other way to do it. And so in many ways, when, when I hear Riet's words, I think, hmm, sounds like me. <laughs> so, yes, I Nobuyo, do you have, do you have anything to, to add to, to that? Or... I wanted to say that's a beautiful quote. It's a, it's a, such a, it, it struck as, as you were reading it, it struck struck home so it's, it's, it's a very spot on it had me thinking of, of Tandi and even Mama Agnes and you think of Tandi's involvement in the war right it's a very it's 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 it's, it's, it's a less brutal sort of involvement and even her ambitions when you, when you can see her sense of, of what liberation is even as she's militant in a very city sense right they they, they invade white only hotels and start disrupting the, the guests, right? That's, that's her sense of trying to, to, to add to, to, to the war. Um, and that's a very different sense from, say, Abednego's involvement in the war, right? Um, but really beautiful quote by Laurie. I, I, 
we should have just all women presidents in, in on the continent for like a couple of decades. We'll, we'll sort a lot of things out. Why just the continent? Let's just uh, take the entire world. <laughs> women There presidents everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and as much as um, I also have found that the two books speak a lot to one another. Um, I mean, I've I've read House of Stone first when it came out in 2019. Um, and then I read The Scattering later on. And in a lot of places, I felt myself also, I felt a connection between the two books in a way, because they did address a lot of similar topics and a lot of similar emotions. And um, also the the ambiguous characters that there is no one entirely good or entirely bad, that everybody carries some humanity in them, but also we're all flawed. Um, and that's a part of, of both texts for sure. And as much as they deal with the, the, the books, deal with the, uh, with the war itself, um, also the effect on those who survived whether they were victims of violence or perpetrators of violence is also it plays just as big a role in both books as well um for house of stone for example although um the framework plot of the book um is set in 2007 so more than 20 years after um i mean 30 like 30 years after um, after independence and 20 years after or, yeah um it still presents us with a set of bro just broken characters in a way people who have coping mechanisms that help them survive but maybe not entirely live to it's like a part of them died and the same is is the case with the characters in the scattering they are broken they they lost something they lost part of their um of their humanity in the war and um i found that very very striking and also violence like domestic violence um violence against women at home is also a part of of both stories and in both stories a part or it's a result of of the violence that people have suffered beforehand. And I found it very, very striking and very powerful. Um, I don't know whether you want to uh, add anything to that. No, okay. I, was, I, <clears throat> I was talking about being at a literary festival in South Africa. And the moderator said that um, uh, the, why there were no good men in the sketching. And I found that so shocking because for me, uh, I first think Ruhapo was a good man. And, I, and a good man uh, will be affected by terrible things happening to them. So, um, like you said, I mean, there, there's domestic violence. And especially, you know, I have a lot of compassion for men because, you know, men are socialized not to cry, to be tough, all of these things not speak about their pain. And it does come out in, in some way. You can't swallow that trauma and not have it come out. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's realistic to think of uh, that's how a, a person would uh, deal with the things that they had to do and the things that they saw, the things that happened to them. Yes. Um... You know, I was I was thinking. I think it's important to acknowledge that that you know that complex trajectory of these lives. Um, I'm thinking of Zimbabwe, um, even Southern Africa, Botswana, continent, all places that have been traumatized by history, which is you know the whole world really. <laughs> uh, some places more so than others, and and for me, it's really about what we've lost, what is lost when not only when war, people are subjected to war, but when they don't deal with with that trauma, right? Um, I'm thinking of a character like Tandy in the novel who had such an auspicious start, um, but has a more tragic ending. I won't go into that, uh, so, uh, not to give us uh, a spoiler. Um, but for me, again, it speaks to 
the grief is not just what one has gone through. It's about the lives, the potential, the potentiality and the other alternative lives that one can no longer live. And I've seen it with my family. Um, you know, my mother went through the liberation war, went through the massacres, went through our third Chimurenga in the 2000s. And I've seen her going through all through these cycles. And you wonder how, how much can one life take, but also what is lost in such a world that's so global and connected and where we see so much potential elsewhere. It is a tragedy that um, for me that at, at home we are still caught in this tragic and unnecessary spiral. We have so much potential, there's mm. so much we need to do. And, and so that's for me, it's important then not to shy away from the truth of what, what is the cost of this, of, of the war, mm. of the massacres, right? What does it cost us all as a people, our dreams, the lives we deserve to live as people, the things we can do and should be doing? Um, yes. Yes, and with, with both texts also are, is not just narratives about war, but also narratives about resilience, about um, how much humans can take and actually continue and push through and survive and find a new beginning and make the best of it that they can. And um, maybe that's also kind of what I would like to leave us on today, rather on a hopeful note, um, that also by addressing the, the violence and the trauma, maybe it's easier to, to overcome the trauma, but also maybe to prevent um, violence that way from happening again, because fiction is a great way to to learn about these things f on an emotional basis. And I think that both your works are uh, really good at doing that, at giving faces and, and, and stories and humanity to the history that happened and, and making it personal and really um, compelling the reader into thinking more uh, about it and being compassionate with other people. Yeah. And yeah, thank I you think, <laughs> and I really enjoyed yeah, and you. loved both both your novels for that um, a lot. And I would highly recommend uh, to everybody to read them. And um, yes, I want to thank you for this conversation. Um, it has been a pleasure, although we were talking uh, dire things and um, difficult topics, but um, it's important to do that. It's important to address them. And uh, I'm very grateful for you to um, be so open about uh, your working processes as well, uh, even though they were also personal and emotional for you. And um, yes, thank you for sharing um, and thank you for writing these books. Wow, thank, thank you so, so much. much. Thank you, Vince. Yeah. It's been such a pleasure um, to talk to you and Laurie, um, and so refreshing yeah. um, and energizing. Um, so thank you. Thanks. Yes, thanks.